And welcome back to the second hour of Nightline. I'm sure you enjoyed our first hour, and Mr. Sally will continue singing. And during this uh, second hour for us, we'll be talking to him briefly a little bit later on. We want you to know, those of you who view us tonight, thanks again for inviting us into your home. Right here at the bottom of the screen, you see those telephone numbers, that local number, an 800 number. Prayer partners are standing by. Now listen, many of you have called in tonight. Many of you have called, and we want to encourage you to keep those calls coming in. People, stand by. They want to pray with you, encourage you. As I say to you when I'm, I'm with you, please give them a call. And again, I want to uh, welcome all my dear friends who join us from Perry Correction Center. Boy, it's so good to have you guys with us, and thanks for the, the cards and the notes that you write me. I'm always glad to hear from you, and I want you to know, too, we pray for you as a church. So you hang in there. God loves you. Jesus loves you. He has not left you. He Don't you dare let Satan defeat you, okay? We want to remind you that we always have a great need here for prayer partners. And uh, if you, a Sunday school class, or maybe a deacon body, or elders, or, or whomever, uh, you might want to come. Would you give us a call here at the station, the local number, 244-1616. Uh, of course, area code 864. We'd like to talk with you, talk with some of your folks about being prayer partners. We, we would appreciate that. But more than that, you'll be the one that walks away with the cup overflowing. Yes, you will. You'll be blessed when you come and talk with these folks who care for you and who love you. And you will find out that in being able to sit behind that desk and answer that telephone, how your love and how your commitment is going to grow, not just to the Lord Jesus, but to those who call. And so uh, tonight, our scripture, love it, from Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end from Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. And uh, I, uh, I, I encourage you, I encourage you to give us a call. We want to hear from you. We want you to know how much we love you and how much the Lord Jesus Christ loves you. You're going to enjoy, as you did in that first hour, right now, Jerry Sally, the preacher and the stranger. All right, Jerry. Those who are familiar with my songwriting style and... Uh, History will know that I love to write story songs, and this particular song is a, a song I recorded on the new project that was originally recorded by the husband and wife duo, Joey and Rory, my dear friends. One called The Preacher and the Stranger. We don't have much here, but you're welcome to it all. The preacher told the stranger at the door, come sit down by this fire. Let the coffee warm you up. I can't say I've seen it rain this hard before. The stranger said, I saw your sign while I was walking down the road. And I figured that a church might be the safest place to go. Well, sun crosses sure get heavy. We've all got one to bear. And if you're looking for a shelter from the storm, you'll find one here. They sat and talked for hours there in that empty church about how life's unfair sometimes, trying to make sense of how God works. And the preacher said, I lost my son one summer. He was only 25, a drunk driver crossed that double yellow line. And I prayed so hard to Jesus to save my only son. Seems all I do these days is question why. I stand here every Sunday and preach to everybody else. I talk a lot about forgiveness. But I can't do it myself. Sun crosses sure get heavy. We've all got one to bear. 
I don't know why I'm telling you all this or if you even care. They sat and talked for hours there in that empty church about how life's unfair sometimes, trying to make sense of how God works. With tears filled the stranger's eyes. He said, I know I've changed a lot. And I might be hard for you to recognize. But late one summer night, I'd had too much to drink. Got behind the wheel and changed both of our lives. Well, I'm sorry just ain't good enough when you hurt someone like that. And God knows if I could, I'd give my life to bring him back. Oh, preacher, crosses sure get heavy. We've all got one to bear. And I'm here to ask forgiveness if you even care. They sat and talked for hours there in that empty church about how life's unfair sometimes trying to make sense of how god works well thank you jerry we we enjoy that music and he's going to continue blessing our hearts tonight right now our guest I'm here, and our guest is there. Well, where is there? Canton, Ohio. Apostle Bo Salisbury. Not only is he a preacher, a teacher, an evangelist, a prophet, he's our guest tonight. And by Skype, we're going all the way from here to there. We want to welcome you, Apostle, from Canton, Ohio. Welcome. Man. So glad to have you, sir. Would this be a first visit for you here at uh, WGGS? Well, it actually would be. It's a pleasure well, to be here. Yeah. Well, it is an honor to have you, sir. And, uh, you know, we enjoy doing Skype interviews from time to time here at the station. And uh, we also have found that our people, our viewers, the hundreds of thousands that tune in, they too enjoy uh, from time to time interviews like this. And, and I really do. I have been reading, uh, just perusing your book. I've not read it all, okay? But uh, ac Accessing Supernatural Grace Through Kingdom Focused Prayer. We'll be talking about this uh, during our time together. But uh, just a few questions. What do you do in the ministry? What is your role? Well, for about 25 years, I've been traveling uh, to various churches uh, in the United States, but also around the world. I think I've been to 22 different nations now. So I minister in churches, but also minister in a number of leadership conferences, encouraging leadership to continue to pioneer God's people forward to advance the kingdom of God. And so one of my roles when I minister in churches or even in leadership conferences right. is helping people break through certain barriers or plateaus that we come up against right. uh, in spiritual momentum and just helping to uh, bring some things to the surface that maybe God's people are oblivious to right. and then help helping to give a strategy to overcome those things. Because truly, I believe that we're all a part of an ever increasing kingdom. Right. And that, that uh, basically means that we have an opportunity to always learn, to always grow, and to always increase our effectiveness in what God's called us to do. Right. So, so my role is to help continue that process. You know, I was uh, reading, reading on the back of your book, excuse me, where it talks about uh, your, your desire to see unity in the body of Christ as well as revival to come back, and and I would think that 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 comes through in all of uh, uh, of your gifts, whether it's a, a prophetic gift, an evangelistic gift, a pastoral mm -hmm. gift, a teacher gift. Um, I, I I would presume that uh, that d desire is burning in your heart, huh? Absolutely. Well, when it comes with to unity and revival, I really believe that to sustain a revival or a move of God, unity is an absolute necessity. And so now unity is it's a 
very broad subject, but really specific implications because it always comes down to the heart. Right. I really believe that as God's people, we need to learn to, number one, recognize the people that God wants us to connect with. Right. And that also, when we recognize that, to give ourselves to relationships, the challenge is giving ourselves to relationships to people that are not like us. Right, right. And so the challenge is walking in love, um, learning to reach out to people who may believe a little bit different than us. Right. But but understanding that we have a common goal and to, to work together is is crucial to see God's kingdom advance in our own lives. I believe there's there's things in other people other churches, other ministries that we need and vice versa. So if we're going to advance the kingdom, we've got to work together, arm in arm. When, when did the Lord call you into ministry? Uh, do you remember teenage years, latter years? When did, he, when did you know God was getting a hold of uh, Bo Salisbury? Well, they tell me, I don't remember this, but I was one to two years old. I used to go around and pray for people and lay hands on people. That's what they tell me. That's cool. But when I was five years old, um, I was born again in a Sunday school room, Crazy. and God really began to become real in my heart and my life. Right. I just, I just had a knowing, just a sense sure. that I was called to ministry at that age. Sure. But I think, I think when I really knew that I knew, I was probably about ten years old. Okay. Went to sleep one night, and I had a dream. It's one of those dreams that is so real, you wake up and you can't believe that it I wasn't understand. real. Understand? Yes, sir. So I was grown up in that dream, and, and I was praying for individual people. I laid hands on someone that was blind, and they were healed. Yes. Um, cast out a devil, uh, raised someone from the dead, and just, just a very real dream. And in that dream, I could feel the power of God, virtue, just coming out of my hands. Yes. And when, when I woke up from that dream, it was middle of the night, probably 3 in the morning, both of my hands were raised in the air. Yes. And just, just tears were falling down my face. And there was just a glory of God in my bedroom, just so strong. Right. And so at that point, I knew that God had a call in my life. But for the next two years following that, it seemed like the enemy also knew that. And so he mm -hmm. came against me with depression and thoughts of uh, suicide. When I was 12 years old, um, I, I came to the place where I really couldn't take the pressure of life. And I, I was basically determined to take take my life. I was in my bedroom looking out the window and uh, basically came up with the, the boldness to do it. I turned around and my plan was to go to my dad's closet, get a shotgun and take my life. Yeah. When I turned around, uh, the Lord Jesus was standing in between me and my bedroom door. Yes. And immediately when I saw him, I fell down to the floor. He began to talk to me in, in simplistic terms. I was 12 years old. Sure. And he, he said to me, give your life to me, and I will make something great of it. And I was just being honest. I said, if life is going to be like this, I, I really I really don't want to live. He said, just trust me. <laughs> and so when, when he said that, all I could say was, yes. Amen. He put his hand on my shoulder, and the, the fear and the depression and the suicide I had been facing for two years immediately left. And God became incredibly real. Amen. And also my determination to follow through with the call of God became very strong at that point. Amen. Tell me now, tell our viewers, what, uh, what is Grace Life International? Well, Grace Life International is the name of my ministry, nonprofit ministry. It's set up really to facilitate the advance of the gospel around the world, different nations. Um, I, I really believe that Every individual should be connected to the body of Christ at large. And so yes. this is a way that, that, I, that I facilitate the call of God on my life to go to the nations and to really see uh, the gospel move forward. So it's, it's an organization just like churches right. uh, have to facilitate that. And so would you, would you uh, when you're there, would you preach or teach uh, uh, in, uh, in, that, uh, in your ministry there unless you're traveling? Do you have associates that work with you? Or elder staff, or over the years, I've I've been a firm believer in team ministry. Yes. yes. And so I've had as many as twelve in terms of the number of team going to different nations. Right. There's been times when, for whatever reason, I wasn't able to take anybody. So there's 
I've gone myself, but for the most part, I try to at least take one or two people. Right. Um, my viewpoint is that the gospel and the and churches and ministry should not be a one-man show. Right. You look, you look at Scripture and you always see teams of ministries, especially apostolic ministry. Right. Because it's, it's a demonstration of the unity of the Spirit. Yes. Uh, it, it, it just um, embodies what the church is all about, which is a family. And right. so when I go places, I like to take people with me for the purpose of, of ministering more effectively to the people we're, we're connecting with. Right. But also there's a ministry that goes on between point A and point B. There's mentorship, there's right. fellowship, there's prayer and encouragement. And so I think it's an important role of, of especially traveling ministries right. is to function in, in team ministry. What inspired you to write Accessing Supernatural Grace through Kingdom Focused Prayer? What, what inspired you to, to write this book? Well, ever since I was 12 years old, I just share that experience I had. Right. I've been a, a consistent person of prayer and the Word of God and just seeking God on a personal level. But over the years, I've seen ebbs and flows of effectiveness in prayer and having an understanding or revelation of, of grace, especially the last 10 years of my life at ministry, right. I wanted to write something that connected the subjects of grace and prayer. You know, if you go to a Christian bookstore, there's a million books on grace, there's a million books on prayer. But I wanted to connect those two subjects together because in my own life, the last several years, I've seen an increased manifestation of God's grace as I've learned to pray, I guess a little bit differently. You know, when I say differently, I mean, not just basically according to what I want or even what I need, per se. Mm -hmm. uh, probably a year and a half ago, um, I had a situation in my life. I had a real estate property that I really needed to sell. It became cumbersome and became right. a challenge for me as I've been traveling a lot more overseas. And, and so I really needed to sell the property. And, and the issue with the property is it was in a very uh, uh, challenging location of town, a lot of gangs and drugs and violence. And, and so the real estate market went downhill and, and I owed more on the property than what it was worth. And, you know, that kind of situation, yeah. but I, I really wanted not just for a financial reason for me to sell the property, but it was more of a kingdom aspect. I've, I've been feeling the call of God and the mandate of God to, to go more consistently to the nations, right. but yet this was cumbersome to me. So when I began to pray, I began to pray prayers like this, God, I just want to be completely free to do what you've called me to do in this season. And because of that, because of your kingdom mandate in my life, I'm exercising faith for you to supernaturally help me recover from the situation. And so when I began to pray prayers, not just based on what I wanted or even what I needed, but what the king needed of me, right. I found that supernatural grace was released. There's a whole testimony behind this. I don't think we have time to share it, but I'll make it real short here. Uh, just shortly after I prayed that prayer, I, someone came up to me, gave me uh, some money in a church service, said the Lord's laid this on my heart to bless your ministry. And my first thought was, well, praise God, I'm believing God for finances for these ministry trips. And, but as soon as I thought that, the Lord said, I want you to give it away. Mm -hmm. So the next day, I connected with a friend of mine, hadn't talked to for 20 years, went to Bible school with him. He had been going through some very difficult times, and the Lord said, I want you to sow your money right there. So I sowed that seed the very next day I received it right. into someone else. That very night, I got a call from my real estate agent, just put the property up for sale two weeks earlier. Mm -hmm. He says, we have a cash offer on your property. And so Whoa. he said, would you, would you be interested in, in a checking that out. I said, absolutely. <laughs> so, so he told me the cash amount of the property. It was considerably above market value on the property. And I'm like, well, this has got to be too good to be true, but checked into it. And lo and behold, it was true. God does. I, I called an investor that had originally borrowed funds from to purchase the property. I said, hey, I've, I've got a cash offer on this property. I'd like to sell it, but it's still not enough to cover the difference of what it's worth. Would you consider uh, helping me out, taking a little bit less for this property than what I owe? I thought about it for about five seconds. He says, you know, yeah, I believe in you. I believe in what God's doing in your life. I, I like to do that. So he discounted several thousand dollars Amen. Right? off of what I owed him. So in a very short time, God made up the difference between what I owed, what the property was worth, enabled me to get free from that and cumbersome and be free. And since then, it's, it's just a, just a simple thing. 
but it's a way that God filled my faith for the next season of my life. Right. And the principle, back getting back to your question, I learned is that when we really sincerely pray with God's kingdom first in mind, yeah. not just what we need or want, God's supernatural grace is released in our lives and enables us to do what we cannot do on our own. I mean, the simple scripture we all know, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. I'm telling you, they had a whole new meeting of my heart. So when that happened, I felt the Lord impressed me to write a book that would help connect the subjects of faith and grace together, but right. digging deeper in our prayer lives. So over the years, I've, I've had a consistent prayer life. But I've noticed that as, as we learn to be led by the Holy Spirit in that prayer, we access supernatural grace that yeah. spills over into our life and our ministry. And that's what I want to encourage people with in this book is to really allow the Holy Spirit to take control of private prayer lives. You know, we've been talking to uh, Apostle Bo Salisbury, and he's in Canton, Ohio, particularly uh, we've begun addressing the book Accessing Supernatural Grace Through Kingdom-Focused Prayer. We're going to come back uh, in just a moment to the apostle and continue our conversation with him. And, and I trust, boy, when you talk to kingdom-focused individuals who see the kingdom of God, not just the denomination, but the kingdom, boy, it brings us some fresh air. Right now, Jerry <laughs> Sally is going to sing for us Mountain View Missionary Baptist Church. All right, Jerry. This song is about a real place. Um, I was at a songwriting retreat over in the Pigeon Forge Smoky Mountain area a few years ago, and uh, we stayed at a cabin out off of Weirs Valley Road, if you're familiar with that part of the country. And uh, there was a little country church that we would pass every day when we'd go get something to eat and come back. And uh, there's a little cemetery up behind the, uh, the church there. And I decided it, uh, after passing it several different times, it was such a beautiful old church that it might be a good idea to write a song about it. And it's called the Mountain View Missionary Baptist Church. Tucked back in the shadow of the mountains Surrounded by the dogwoods and tall pines a hundred-year-old church house is still standing And every Sunday it's like stepping back in time You won't find a more friendly congregation They'll shake your hand and greet you with a smile The minute you walk in the sanctuary You can feel God's presence there inside where they pray, pray, pray Like they know God is listening And they shout, shout, shout Amen, amen To affirm the preacher's word And they sing, sing, sing Lift their voices up to heaven With the sweetest sound you've ever heard at the Mountain View Missionary Baptist Church. There's a cross on every stained glass window. All the pews are made of quarter sawn oak. The carpet's worn from kneeling at the altar Where peace can be found for troubled souls When Sister Anna Smith gets in the spirit She runs up and down the aisle with both hands raised And once you hear Reverend Wilford Watson preaching You're gonna leave there with a lot more faith where they pray, pray, pray Like they know God is listening And they shout, shout, shout Amen, amen To 
affirm the preacher's words. And they sing, sing, sing. Lift their voices up to heaven with the sweetest sound you've ever heard. At the Mountain View Missionary Baptist Church, where they pray, 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 like they know God is listening. And they shout, 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 amen, amen, to affirm the preacher's word. And they sing, 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 lift their voices up to heaven with the sweetest sound you've ever heard. At the Mountain View Missionary Baptist Church, at the Mountain View Missionary Baptist Church. Thank you again, Jerry. Great music and how we've been blessed by that music tonight. We've been talking with Apostle Bo Salisbury. He's up in Canton, Ohio. And even though we're here, he is there. And uh, my, how blessed we've been in that first segment, uh, author of Accessing Supernatural Grace Through Kingdom-Focused Prayer. Uh, Apostle, let me ask you, with a Cliff Notes approach to your book, <laughs> mm -hmm. let's hear from you. What, what's it about? Well, Accessing Supernatural Grace really has to do with our private prayer life, learning how to be led by the Holy Spirit. Now, now here's the thing. Every believer comes from a different stripe of Christianity and different emphasis is, is taught and instilled in each believer on what our prayer life should look like. You know, some parts of the body of Christ might emphasize Bible reading. Others might emphasize prayer or private worship or some uh, will emphasize praying in tongues or whatever it might be. Right. But so we all have this um, perspective of what our prayer life sh should look like based on what we're taught. And then we also have uh, different preferences and things that we like to do in pursuing God and hearing his voice and those kind of things. What I do in this book is help people to think outside the box of what they've been taught um, and what their, what their preferences are to really allow the Holy Spirit to lead them. Because sometimes we get led by our traditions yes. and by our preferences and not by the Holy Spirit. Now you're a prophet. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> So if we're going to be effective in our prayer life, we need to learn to be led by the Holy Spirit. So this book helps to uncover some of those things, unravel some of those things, and helps the believer to understand the absolute importance, number one, of a consistent prayer life, but that's not good enough. No. We need to be consistently led by the Holy Spirit Amen. in our prayer life. And that's how we can download from heaven supernatural grace mm. that spills over into our life and our ministry. See, my, my belief is that if we can learn to be led by the Holy Spirit in our time with the Father in prayer, the Word and worship, we, we, can, we can train ourselves to be learned to, to led, led by the Holy Spirit in our daily life and in our ministry. And so I believe, go ahead. Now, in, in chapter 5, you title it Spiritual Responsibility. I was reading, just perusing this earlier. I like uh, there, page 65, you can't win if you don't play by the rules. And how profound that is <laughs> when we balance that against mm -hmm. spiritual responsibility. Can you add right. to that? I really, I got to read this chapter. Add to that, would you please? Well, it go goes two, two ways here as far as playing by the rules. God sets the rules of engagement of how we're to relate with him. Um, if, we, if we do something just because we were taught a certain way or just because we have preferences a certain way, that may not be exactly what the Holy Spirit would have us do that particular day. See, one thing I learned about uh, Jesus in his prayer life and his ministry, yes. it wasn't the same all the time. Now, Jesus consistently spent time with the Father in the wilderness. He went to the mountain for all-night prayer meetings. He, uh, you know, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed. Even on the cross, he's talking to the Father. Jesus had a very consistent 
prayer life, but what you notice about his ministry, it wasn't the same all the time. No. He would heal people. Sometimes he would spit in someone's eyes and tell them to go wash in a pool and be healed. Yeah. Other times he would speak the word in another town somewhere. Someone would receive a miracle. Yes. Other times he would lay hands on the sick and they would be healed. What Jesus did in his ministry was recognize what God was doing and just cooperate with him. He didn't force things to happen. No. He, he cooperated with God as they were happening. And I believe the, the reason why he was able to flow so effectively in ministry yes. and in daily life in his relationships is because in his prayer life, he consistently downloaded grace and let the Holy Spirit empower him. So that, that's one of the myths sometimes Christians have is we think, well, Jesus did all these miracles right. because he was the son of God. Well, that's not true. Jesus did all the miracles, cast out the devils, fed the 5,000, because the Holy Spirit enabled him by grace right. to do that. Right. Jesus showed us as believers how we can do the same exact things wow. by, by having a time with the Father and allowing the Holy Spirit to empower us. I mean, Jesus did no miracles until he was 30 years old, until at his baptism, the Spirit of God came upon him. Right. At that time, you see this process kind of played out. Right. So when you talk about playing by the rules, of course, you're asking a, a two-way question here. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think we should play by the rules necessarily that we're taught because sometimes well-meaning people can teach us things that may not be altogether accurate. Right. And that's, that's the power of tradition. Right. And sometimes we, 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 we buy into things hook, line, and sinker because the people that teach us really do love us. Yes. And they really do believe those things. And they really are sincere. And because we love them, we tend to embrace the tradition without taking that tradition and comparing it to the Word of God. Absolutely. So, so I believe we all have traditions. Yeah. I believe we all have preferences. Yes. Yes. But if we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to fulfill His ministry in our lives, we've got to allow Him to unravel some of those to have more effectiveness in our prayer life. Here's a question for you. How would uh, this book help people to have a more effective ministry? For example, like myself, say other pastors who might be listening mm -hmm. to us tonight or staff people or deacons, elders, ruling ruling bodies of, of local uh, churches. Uh, how, how would this help us all to have a more effective ministry? Well, I believe that true ministry flows out of relationship. I believe our relationship with God is very foundational to what we receive as grace from God, a word from God, yes. to release in ministry. Yes. Now, one, one of the challenges in ministry, as you well know, it's very easy to get so busy trying to fulfill what God has put in our hearts that it's easy to allow our prayer life to take a back seat. It's, it's very easy to get burnt out spiritually in ministry. I believe part of this is it comes down to our, our private prayer life. Right. Many times, especially pastors, have a hard time saying no. Mm -hmm. The problem is we end up sacrificing marriages, families, our own physical health, our own well-being sometimes right. because we want to help people so much yes. we, fail, we fail to help ourselves. And so I, b I believe this book is going to be a, a stern reminder for all for all leaders to make time with God a priority. I believe that should be the priority over our ministries. And if we do that, and you know, we learn how to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, I'm, I believe we'll be more effective in our ministry. Right. I believe he'll, he'll let us know. Jesus demonstrated this for us. Yes. He said that he never did anything unless he saw the Father doing it. He never taught anything unless he heard the Father speaking it. I believe we can be more effective in ministry by following the footsteps of Jesus, not just doing good things, not trying to make things happen, but be developing a sensitivity in our private prayer life to, to recognize the voice of God, to follow what he says and nothing else. Amen. Amen. Many of you might want to visit his uh, website. Uh, you can get more information, purchase the book. We'll put that uh, website up there for you. you. You see it up there. There is his uh, snail mail address. Underneath that, uh, 
you can see uh, that Grace Life int dot org www of course dot grace life int dot org uh, you can go on to that uh, website there you can find out about ordering these books uh, I want to encourage you to do that I, I do it you can of course you saw the snail mail address and and uh, people you can certainly write that PO box twenty three fifteen North Canton Ohio forty four seven two zero is the, the zip code. Uh, I want you to check out that website. Check it out. It's, uh, you will enjoy that. You'll learn more about a, a Apostle uh, Bo Salisbury. Coming back to the Apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher, preacher, and, and you know, and, and I think, and with all reverence I say that because many times God gifts us in, in these ways and, and we as, as, for example, pastors have to speak many times prophetically. We have to mm. speak many... Well, you understand where I'm coming from. All right, here's a question for you, though. Um, where do you stand with the grace message in light of the extremes on that subject in recent years? Where do you stand <laughs> on it? <laughs> That's a loaded question right there. Yes, it is loaded. <laughs> well, I believe that grace, when it's misunderstood is misunder misapplied grace does not just deal with sin it deals with gifting and empowerment right. and so there's there's a there's a section or a group in the body of christ who believes the grace of god is so big that sin is no longer relevant it doesn't matter what we do because we're covered by grace right. and okay. jesus paid the price for our forgiveness so it doesn't matter but what they don't understand is they're falling right into the prophetic uh, scripture in Jude, verse number three. Yeah. It says that many will come and turn the grace of the Lord into lasciviousness, which is King James Version for right. loose or riotous fleshly living. Right. That's exactly what's happening to a portion of the body of Christ. Yes, it is. Now, I, be I believe that true grace, scripturally, it, it deals with divine enablement, divine empowerment. I mean, the, the little, little word grace comes from the word charis in the Greek. It literally means divine influence in the heart of man that reflects in his life. Right. And so truly what grace is, is the supply of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so the Holy Spirit doesn't lead us to sin. He empowers us to overcome sin. And so that's what the, the true grace message is not disregarding our sin or the consequence thereof the true grace message is allowing the ministry of the holy spirit in our hearts and lives to help us overcome right. sin right. so that you've got one section in the body of christ who's really leaning towards legalism right another another section on the other extreme is 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 loose living like we mentioned i believe god wants us to live a life not dominated by sin but right. learning to overcome and to you know, also learning to cooperate better with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Right. You know, uh, Apostle, we've got just a couple more minutes before we wrap up. Is uh, there anything more in just a couple of minutes or less, anything more you want to say to our viewers tonight about your ministry, the book, uh, just to wrap up this interview, just have to take less than two minutes. Would you do that, please, sir? Sure, absolutely. In in regards to the, the book, and I mentioned I wanted to, uh, write something that connected the subjects of grace and prayer. You know, when we think about the subject of prayer, I think we need to understand that prayer is a lot more than asking God for stuff. It's an opportunity to connect with the Father, uh, to, to know Him more, to become more like Him, and to download grace that will enable us to represent Him how He has gifted us. And so I want to encourage all of you that are listening right now, let prayer be a time of surrender, a time where you really submit your heart, your life, everything to the will of the king. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I want to encourage all of you to let prayer be a time of discovery where you, you learn what God wants for you. You discover God's will. You receive revelation from the Father. You hear the voice of God. But thirdly, let prayer be a time of agreement, a time where you learn to cooperate with the Father. I really believe that faith comes 
by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I believe when God speaks to you, faith is birthed in your spirit. Amen. But when you come into agreement with that faith and you begin to give voice to that and take steps of action with that, that's when grace is released. Amen. We get access into grace by faith. Amen. And so when we, when we look at prayer as a way to surrender and to discover what God wants and then cooperate, we find that grace just spilling over in our lives. I want to thank you, Apostle. You've been, boy, you blessed us tonight uh, all the way from Canton, Ohio. And our prayers are with you and your great ministry. May you continue to mount up with wings like eagles. And, uh, and it is our prayer that... Uh, uh, you are going to send me my autographed copy of the book. I'm going to always put that in there. But I want to thank you for being part. And uh, again, I want to encourage you as viewers, go to that website if you would, www.gracelifeint.org. Apostle Bo Salisbury in Canton, Ohio, may the Lord bless you and grant you great greatness for His sake in your ministry. Thanks for being part of our Skype interview, man. Appreciate you. Right now, Jerry Sally, the broken one. Jerry. The last song I'd like to share with you this evening is a song that's not actually on the gospel from my grassroots CD. Um, I recorded it several years ago on my show and my age project. But um, it's a song that I get a lot of requests for. And uh, when I was writing this song, we needed a name for the girl in the song, for the character in the song. And I thought of my baby girl, Maggie, because uh, growing up, she never asked for anything new. She always wanted me to fix what was broken. And uh, this song was actually written as a country song, but it became a number one song for me, uh, recorded by the Tallies. And also Guy Penrod from the Gaither Vocal Band has recorded, have, has recorded this. Uh, one called The Broken Ones. Maggie came home one day with a raggedy, raggedy Ann. Said, Mama, looky here what I found in the neighbor's garbage can. It had a missing left arm and a right button eye hanging by a thread. She carried it gently up to her room and laid it on her bed with her other dolls. She loves the broken ones, the ones that need a little patching up. She looks for diamonds in the rough and makes them shine like new. It really doesn't take that much, a willing heart and a tender touch. If everybody loved like she does, there'd be a lot less broken ones. Twenty years later in a shelter on 18th Avenue, a 17-year-old girl turns up all black and blue with needle tracks in her left arm, almost too weak to stand. She says, I'm lost and I need help as Maggie takes her hand and says, come on in. She loves the broken ones, the ones that need a little patching up. She looks for diamonds in the rough and makes them shine like new. It really doesn't take that much, a willing heart and a tender touch. If everybody loved like she does, there'd be a lot less broken ones. If you call her an angel, she'll be quick to say to you, she's just doing what the one who died for her would do. Love the broken ones, the ones that need a little patching up. Look for diamonds in the rough and make them shine like new it really doesn't take that much a willing heart and a tender touch if everybody loved like he 
does. There'd be a lot less broken ones if everybody loved like she does. There'd be a lot less broken ones. Maggie came home one day with a raggedy, raggedy Ann. Thank you so much, Jerry. Man, we appreciate uh, that great music. He's coming back over here to join us in just a moment. I hope you've enjoyed the program tonight. Now listen, we've had great music, we've had great guests, but even more than that, we've had the Spirit of God with us here. You see those numbers still at the bottom of your screen? Would you go right now? There's still time. Prayer partners, stand by. They stand by to receive your call. They want to pray with you. They'll encourage you. Whatever you need, they will bear a burden with you. And I want to encourage you, please, go to the phone right here are your numbers. Whether you're in the local area, outside, give them a call. Would you do that? Jerry Sally, welcome to Nightline. We appreciate you. your presence. Thank and you. you've been singing for us all night. And uh, we've enjoyed your music. Well, and you. tell thank us you. about, is this the new CD? This is my brand new CD. It's called Gospel from My Grassroots. And that's my uh, six-year-old granddaughter on the cover there. And I tell folks I'm more uh, excited about what's on the outside than I am what's on the Can inside. Can you believe? <laughs> we've been, now, let me tell you I'm going to get my autographed copy, all right? And that means if Pastor Benny's got an autographed copy, you need to go to jerrysallymusic at gmail.com or jerrysally.com and get a copy of this uh, wonderful CD that has a picture of one of the prettiest girls in the world, <laughs> his granddaughter, okay? And so uh, tell us about, about the CD, uh, Gospel from My Grassroots. I love that. Well, what? Uh, Pastor Benny, I was raised uh, in a bluegrass family, in a Christian uh -huh. family, right. and my dad played five-string banjo, and he, mm -hmm. uh, he wasn't a professional. He was, so, he was just too shy to get on stage, but he drug me around to different neighborhoods and different picking parties every weekend of my life yeah. when I was little, and so I grew up around Flatt and Scruggs and the Lewis yep. family. Lewis family was one of his greatest groups, you know, one of his favorite groups. But I grew up around that, and so I, I was immersed in country and bluegrass and gospel Were you music. picking or just playing guitar? Uh, well, basically, I was singing. Okay. Uh, when, when he'd take me to the picking parties, I would play rhythm guitar. Gotcha. He got me my first guitar when I was about six years old. And I was on stage the first time at 10 years That's old. Great. That's great. But um, we would uh, go around, and I would be the one singing most of the stuff while everybody else was, was the main pickers. I, I still wish I was better on the guitar than I am today, but, uh, but it, I, I learned well enough just to be able to sing and write songs. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but as time went on, I've, I've recorded. Uh, I've been very blessed to have over 450 different songs recorded in the in, the in country bluegrass and gospel, mm -hmm. and uh, it's been very blessed. And so, so how did you get started? Was it Dad that mm -hmm. started it all for you? Dad gave me the inspiration and the love for the music. I always wanted. I just always thought that this is what I would do for a living. I know yeah. that sounds crazy. I was telling somebody the other night at a program I did, I said, I don't understand some of these kids today that even when they're in college, they still don't know what they want to do when right. they grow up, you know, and I guess maybe I was just weird. I, I, I knew I wanted to sing and write music ever yeah. since I was just a little fella. Yeah. And uh, the, the gospel project, is all, all the projects I've ever recorded, I've always included gospel songs on the records, mm -hmm. but I, this is the first chance I've had to actually do an all bluegrass gospel CD. Wow, isn't that great? Yeah. So, and you, uh, how many, uh, players do you have on, on this particular CD? I think there's six different players on this particular project. Uh, some of the best in the business. Yeah. Uh, Jason Roller played fiddle and, and guitars. Mm -hmm. um, Aaron McDerris, the banjo player, he plays for Rhonda Vincent okay. full time. Yeah. Uh, okay. Troy Engel, a great multi-instrumentalist. Uh, Mike Bubb, the IBMA b uh, bass player of the year. Uh, Kevin Grant also is on there and, and just some of my best friends yeah. really. Yeah, and uh, they were kind enough to come in and help me out. And of course, I wrote everything on there, co-wrote everything on right, there. Right, right. And the music you've been playing tonight, uh, these are song. These are your songs. Yes. Uh, and these are all my songs. And uh, uh, one in particular um, that I didn't play tonight, but that's on the CD. Um, when I first moved to Nashville, mm -hmm. I got a job at a place called Opryland USA. Yes. It's a theme park, mm -hmm. and I played in the Country Music USA show. And one of the fellows that I worked with out there, we were Flat and Scruggs together, actually. Mm. His cool. name was Steve Chapman. 
And y'all played and some of the Lester Flat yeah, Earl right. Scruggs. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's yes, right. I love it. <laughs> and uh, we wrote a song called Hiding Place that got him a record deal. And then we wrote a song called His Strength is Perfect. The next thing I know, his name was Stephen Curtis Chapman. Oh. So, oh, and, and Steve is actually singing on the record on that song with me on the new record. Right. So he's, he's been a great friend of mine. Oh, my, my. I can't wait to listen. How did, uh, how is your faith in Jesus Christ? How has has it impacted your career? Well, it's 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 impacted my entire life. Um, I've even have co-writers today that will come up to me and say, well, "Why do you write gospel songs?" Because there's not near as much money in that as there right. is the country stuff, right. you know. And I, it's an easy answer. It's because I have to, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I was uh, I was 12 years old when I got saved. A little country church called Hilltop Mission Church, and I would walk there from my home. We lived out in the country, uh -huh. and uh, I got saved at a very young age. Um, went through a lot of different uh, situations with churches and witnessing as a young boy some turmoil in some of the churches, yeah, you know. Yeah. And it was a real life lesson for me. But I never kept my, you know, I always kept my focus. I never took my eyes off of the, off of God. Right, right. And uh, it didn't matter what denomination or sure, what, sure. you know, it just, it, what all that meant to me was that he was the center of my life. Absolutely. And uh, so everywhere I go, every show I do, for, for my whole life, I've always ended with a gospel song. And it doesn't matter what sure. kind of venue I played. We always played gospel songs at Great. the end. Great. Because I want to try to reach people with my music. That's the whole purpose, you know, is yeah. uh, I want to take what God, I feel like has been a blessing and a gift to me right. and try to share that with right. other folks. How many CDs would you have? Then? Well, I've only done three solo okay. CDs. I did okay. uh, a, a CD back in 2007 called New Songs Old Friends. Okay. Straight bluegrass record. It's got some gospel stuff on it. Matter of fact, Sonia Isaacs is, play, is singing on there with okay. me. Okay, all right. And then I've got Vince on one song, Ricky Skaggs on one song, the Oak Ridge Boys is doing a song called John and the Jordan that I wrote that was a big hit for uh, Ernie Halston's signature sound a yes. few years ago. Yes, I know Ernie and, well. Uh, so anyway, um, I've just been uh, been really really blessed to, to know all these people and get to get to be friends with them. But that was the first CD I did was an, uh, had a guest on every single song. And isn't it amazing that probably most of the folks that you've worked with are born again believers? But even if they weren't, the the witness you gave them. Well, I, I mean, hope I hope I did my part. You know, you, you <laughs> did. I mean, because you know, sometimes people want to know that we're real. I mean. You know, I, yeah. I, I, I have a, a good musical background and, and love music, and I don't, it doesn't b matter to me. Uh, if I can, I'm going to share my faith whether I'm in the pulpit or sitting on a set of drums. Absolutely. You know? and, and how God does that. Absolutely. Now, people can contact you through your email and through your website. Let's say that they want to have you in their church or they want to have you at some festival or some conference. If uh, you're watching tonight, that you can certainly contact me by snail mail, uh, yes. P.O. Box 121041 there in Nashville with a 37212 uh, zip. And then, but it's easier just to go to jerrysally.com. Mm -hmm. Want to write him, jerrysallymusic at gmail.com. You can contact him and uh, he'll be sure to respond. Do you do a lot of traveling in the South or is it nationwide? What, what? Well, I've traveled all over the country and uh, believe it or not, I have a really strong connection to the country music community in, in Australia. Oh. Matter of fact, I'm taking off in October, uh, the second week of October, I'll be doing a, a bluegrass tour over there for four weeks in a row. Wow. Be my fifth trip over there and produce a couple of their country acts over there. Isn't that And great? I'm hoping to sing at some churches. We're trying to get some churches yeah. lined up while I'm there this time. Yeah. But um, mainly it's in the south and southeast. I'm from Ohio originally. Right. I was born and raised in a little town called Chillicothe uh -huh. and uh, moved to Nashville right after I graduated from college, I mean, within weeks. Right. And um, so most of my shows are in, I would say, in the south and south southeast okay. part of the country. But, but we travel all over the country. And now when you travel, now is it you and your uh, pretty wife or is it yes. you and your pretty wife in the band? Or, well, it's, you, it's usually Aaron and I. I do a lot of shows uh, and programs that they, they usually bill it as Jerry Sally, the stories behind the songs. Okay. And I'll do like a, I don't know if folks are familiar with the Bluebird Cafe in Nashville, but uh -huh. I will do a, like I did here tonight. Uh -huh. I'll share the story of the song, uh, the, the story behind the song, and then I'll sing the song for them. And uh, and I do I enjoy it. Last night I played uh, at a Presbyterian church in Hendersonville, North Carolina. Yeah, we, had right. a, we had a great time. I bet you did. And uh, it's just it's just a great opportunity. I've got the chance to do a lot more church uh, programs.
programs wow. since this new CD came out. And right. that's, I appreciate so much, Pastor Benny, the opportunity right. to be on here with you today. Oh, my, and, and I want to encourage you. You need to get to that website. You need to get, now, I've got the, I'll get the autograph copy. <laughs> Uh, and uh, but I, I want to encourage you to go and do that. I want to say to you, Jerry, you have blessed our heart tonight in music. Well, your you. your presence here. We've had so many prayer requests come in. Every one of these will be prayed over uh, individually in the days to come. But right now, Jerry and I are going to collectively pray over them. Jerry, if you'd lay hands on these with me and just offer a brief prayer, please. Absolutely, sir. Lord. We just bring all of these requests to you today and. Uh, we know that you are the great physician. Yes, There's no need that you are not uh, unaware of. That's right. There's not any problem that anyone has mm. anywhere that you're not aware of. And we just ask that all of these folks yes. who have who've, who've offered up their, their issues, their, yes. whether it's physical, yes. whatever. mental, whatever it is, yes. Lord, we know that you are the one great Amen. physician Amen. who can heal and answer every Amen. single one of these requests. And we just pray, Lord, that you would do that right now. Right. Yes, sir. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 We want to thank you for joining us. We know you had a lot of choices tonight. Thank you so much for inviting us into your home. It's our joy to come with something that's always clean in the air, Christian television. And from all of us, as our, our, the clock runs down tonight, let me just say, couldn't do it without all these great people who are behind the cameras. One day, we're going to let you see them all. We couldn't do it without prayer partners and financial partners. Thank you for giving. Thank you for praying. But we couldn't do any of this without the power of the Lord Jesus Christ through the spirit of, of his Holy Spirit. So we recognize that. So thanks for being part. And as Dante says, as his daddy says, we'll see you in the air or we'll see you on the air. Thanks. Until next time, God bless. <laughs>